This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with former professional rugby player Christian Day. The former Northampton Saint discusses some of his rugby journey and how he was challenged during his playing career, what makes world-class players stand out from the rest, as well as his work at the Rugby Players Association and how he supports current professionals. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you share it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy it. Perfect. Christian, thank you very much for bearing with me. I know I have had some challenges this morning getting online, but um, yeah, I appreciate that. All, all good your end? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, Michael. No problem. And uh, looking forward to speaking. Perfect. So um, I'm really excited by this for, for a variety of reasons. I think obviously you've got um, some exciting kind of journey stuff to go over with the listeners and myself, which we'll get into, but also kind of the work that you're doing now, which I think probably never been more high profile in terms of support that athletes need to get kind of away from the pitch or when they're in and around and stuff so really excited to have this for people that maybe don't know you don't know your history do you want to kind of give a whistle stop tour of where you've been and then what you're currently doing and what that role entails <laughs> yeah sure um my name's christian day i played professionally for 17 years uh, i played for sales shot stade francais paris and uh, northampton saints uh, I won the Premiership twice uh, and a few other trophies along the way. Um, and I'm now Head of Player Affairs at the Rugby Players Association in England, which works primarily with a big focus on rugby for me, uh, but I also work with the England players as part of their Team England deal. Perfect. So I guess the first thing is, what does that role entail when you're, when you're trying to support those players? What does that actually do from a practical set and what are you looking to support them with? Yeah, sure. So if, if you think uh, the Players Association, it, it's kind of labelled as an association or, or a trade union, but there's a lot of facets to the work that goes on. So there's really three key areas for us. There is uh, trade union activities and kind of rugby expertise that that will encompass player welfare and a number of other kind of work strands. There's the player development side of the business called Gainline, um, which is all about trying to help players prepare for rugby uh, post-career, but also educating on key topics whilst they're playing. So things like um, performance enhancing drugs or um, gambling awareness, things like that will all be delivered by our Gainline team uh, within the clubs. And then finally, there's our charity restart, which helps players pick up the pieces who really do need some help so my work is primarily in that rugby focus it's all about for me player engagement you know our, our biggest asset is our members we, we have an incredibly strong membership in this country we're up around about 90 percent of players will sign up with us um and it's all about me engaging with players particularly kind of key players for me you know key, key individuals who've either got a lot of experience or are very kind of engaged in the game and it's about trying to get their opinions and make sure their opinions are heard so that's a very uh, rough example of what i get perfect and so when, when you're looking at those um i guess engagement of players what strategies do you use to try and get more senior individuals to you know take i guess a little bit of time out of their day but then care for i guess ultimately teams or groups of players that they work with to ensure that they're their voices are being heard. Yeah, sure. So there's three levels to this for me. And, and a lot of my work came from a guy called Don Davis, who um, he works in the NFL. He's an ex uh, New England Patriot. And he is head of player affairs at the NFLPA. So, you know, in speaking with him, um, you know, he's all about touch points with players. You've got to, you've got to actively physically engage with someone to make sure that they feel like their opinions are being heard. So, so for me, it's all about touch points with players. Now, when I say players, like I said, there's three different levels to this. So we have our player representatives. So these are players within each club or team, because we also represent the England women and the England sevens teams, who puts their hand up and says, you know, I really care about my teammates. or I really care about the game. So that they will be an, an advocate in the club for us, but also someone who we pretty much guarantee will be engaged. 
Now, part of my role is trying to encourage the right people to do that. So you know, off the top of my head, over the last few years, we've had uh, player representatives like George Cruz, um, Josh Beaumont, um, Alex Waller, Tom, uh, not Tom Wood, Alex Waller, um, you know, guys kind of who've, who've played a lot. And at the moment, Vicky Cornborough from the Red Roses, who is our vice chair currently, is absolutely outstanding. You know, she is someone who... I hope works in rugby for a long time because she is, is outstanding. So that's one level. We then have at each club. I'll, I'll kind of identify with the rep and also with other people who work in the club, development managers, etc. Who are the key kind of influencers within the club? So they'll go on my kind of list of people that I want to get touch points with. So it's a lot of this is names you'd expect, but sometimes uh, it'll surprise you who the who the kind of influential guys are within each club, guys and girls. Um, so that's kind of level two. And then, as I said, I do quite a bit of work now with the England teams, both the men and the women. So we actually have a player appointed committee for both of those teams who aren't necessarily the senior player group on the field, but are guys and girls that are really well respected within the group. And again, have an interest in not just the on-field matters, but off-field. So, so again, the engagement with those groups is something that I brought in in the last couple of years, and it's been a massive success. Um, you know, if you pose a question to 30 rugby players, you'll seldom get an answer because they'll all wait for someone else to answer. Whereas if you've got a committee of four, which is what we have for both teams, the captain sits alongside that committee. And, and if I engage with those five players, I'll get five responses. I'll get five, uh, I'll get five answers. And it's kind of on me to distill down how we can then make that happen off. And how much do the, the issues get highlighted, um, like, I guess, secretive internal issues, and how much of it is uh, things that are well known? So if you look at from a health perspective, obviously concussions has been one, a big one over the last few years that media have played, played a big part in. How much of it is people maybe voicing concerns and stuff over that? And how much of it is actual, like, in my specific environment, I'm finding challenges with the level of facilities we have or, or what that looks like. Yeah, again, it can be very diverse. Um, I'll say this, I think the medical teams around the game are absolutely brilliant. You know, rugby is a a tough, tough sport. Uh, it's a long season. And at the RPA, we very much work that, that the medical teams are, are top of the the line the right way to say it. Uh, they are you know the top top standard of medical care and we truly believe that so in terms of players coming forward with secrets things like that very very rarely I, I can't think of one off the top of my head really more so it will be discussion around things like you know how do how do we mitigate against the fact that the very best players are in such a you know so working with that England committee is a discussion around how do we manage their load over a year, which is how it's measured, because they want to play in all the big games. They, they want to go on tour to South Africa with the Lions. They want to come back and play the first premiership game for their club. They want to play all year. They want to play for England all year, play in Europe. They want to play in all the finals. and Then they want to go on tour to Australia. So, you know, that's, that's what's facing those top, top players this year. The discussion is how do we manage those players through that as a game? So we have to have some trust in the clubs and in the England environment that have been managed in those environments. But my job is more looking at the game as a whole, as a wider viewpoint. Um, and those discussions are never simple. <laughs> it's never an easy answer. Um, and it's about trying to build in little layers of... Uh, guidance or protections or advice um, in order that we we ultimately do what, what our role at the RPA is, which is to ensure that players have the longest, most successful career they can. Um, so that's one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got young players. You know, how do we make sure the best young players get playing opportunities? Not just playing opportunities amongst their peers, but with older and stronger and better players how do we start to expose them to more and more senior rugby so that these outstanding young players that we have in england and we do have them um you know england have made eight of the last 10 junior world cup finals as an example of that. 
how do we make sure that they're getting the exposure they need to progress to first team rugby? So lots of different kind of little debates will go on. For me, like I said, it's about that engagement and touch points, and it's about trying to listen to lots and lots of different opinions and then try and distill it down so that we actually do something tangible. Because if all we ever do is complain, we'll never really get very far. And that's, that's something that we as an organization need to be careful about. If all you ever do is complain about the current system, you'll never really change it. The idea is that we, we try and collaborate with the other people who have skin in the game to, to try and improve things. Okay, so I've got two questions on the back of that. So the first one is around the allowing the pathway through. Obviously, I am come from a traditional football background, and I think that particularly at the top level, that's getting harder and harder for players to get through when people are chucking money at a you know, 27-year-old from Brazil, you know, trying to convince them to put a 19-year-old from Hackney into the team can prove a little bit challenging. So what... Um, is there, have you got any examples of a team that does it particularly well and maybe why they have so much success? Um, no, it's, often you'll get like a crop. So if you think of the Saracens team now, um, there was a real crop of good young players who all came through together. So I think Farrell, Itoje, George, Cruz were all in the same kind of age group. They all kind of came through in a, in a kind of three or four year spell. And they all are now seniors, you know, heading towards the other end of their career. At the moment, Leicester, a team who for years people talked about how they had a good crop of young players coming through. I think they won two or three under 18 academy tournaments in a row. And the likes of um, Jack Van Portfleet and Freddie Stewart are now from that crop. And I think as, as they come through, they kind of pull each other through. So if, um, you know, if you see your teammate that you play for under eight, 18s with mixing it with the first team, you're all of a sudden a lot more confident to do it yourself. So that's one good example is, is good young players playing together and showing each other that they can do it, dragging each other along. Um, there's also a lot of work, I think, within the academies that gets done. And how do we, how do we produce playing opportunities for those guys? Because. You know, when I started around about just after 2000, there was an under 21s league that doesn't exist anymore. Um, so now for this academy group now, a lot of them will be sent out on loan. But I think there's probably opportunities in the Premiership Cup, which are there at the moment, but I'd like to see even more because those I think are the really, really good opportunities where an 18, 19, 20 year old academy player aspiring to move into the first team gets to play alongside some of those first team players in front of a good crowd. So again, lo loads of different levels of opportunity. Um, it's just about how we make sure that those opportunities exist. I think that that pathway is really interesting. I think that there's a really interesting point around the groups of people coming through. If I look at it from like a Man United point of view, you say about that class of 92, which is a group of that come through and they haven't had as much success since then. But Chelsea have been the same recently where you've got your Reese Jameses and Mason Mounts. It does seem that actually if you get a cluster of people who all know one another and all push one another, it does allow that jump maybe to be slightly easier than, you know, the one player going in. Definitely. Um, and then in terms of, um, you mentioned kind of working collaboratively. I'd imagine some of the challenges you have around scheduling, there's going to be maybe a slight level of conflict in terms of you trying to say to clubs, listen, you might not be able to play them all the time or say to the country, have you thought about, you know, resting them for this period to give them this period where they'd be competitive? How do you prepare yourself as a, either individual organisation when you're going into those meetings where maybe you're highlighting something that they might not want to hear from a scheduling point of view? Yeah, sure. So look, we all, all the work in terms of welfare kind of operates on risk and it's, you know, our aspiration is to make um, all our members' career as long as possible uh, and, and the career they want to have, really. So injuries obviously derail that. And, and make that task a lot harder. So, so we all the work we do is based on risk. Certainly at Premiership Rugby, they they do a lot of work in sports science, 
we have the leading study on injury rates in the world. It's called PRISP. I'm going to try and decipher what that means. The Professional Rugby Injury Surveillance Project, uh, which comes out annually. And that steers globally, really, welfare provisions because it is the, the biggest and the best study. It's been going the longest. So if PRISP generally says something, then the game reacts. So there'll always be anecdotal evidence around things, but if Crisp says something, you can guarantee people will take notice. So that's that's a very powerful study. The the big challenge in rugby at the moment is around head injury. Um, <coughs> concussion was something that came to light. I'm going to say. 10, 15 years ago, there was a much increased spotlight on concussion. I think rugby did a really good job of trying to mitigate against that and get some processes in place, which other sports now look at with a bit of envy. But brain health goes beyond concussion, and that's the current discussion that's being had. So it's not just about concussions, which are major you know, brain injuries. Brain injuries can happen at a much lower scale, and it's about this repetitive head impact, the likes of what boxers sustained, and you see boxers who are punch drunk, like we don't want rugby players experiencing that. There are some players, and ex-players at the moment, obviously bringing a lawsuit to the game, and no one wants to think that they're going to retire from the sport and, and be left with the concerns that those players have. So that's the big challenge in terms of welfare at the moment. The games in England's taking some good steps again with this, this summer, um, instrumented mouth guards are going to be brought in and made available to every premiership club, every women's um, Allianz 15s club. Um, and those mouth guards will feed into a study which will definitively tell us how many and what size head impacts our members are going through. And I think that study will steer the game globally um, once its findings are made. How do you manage that with your members? Because I can imagine for some of them, you've, you've got the immediacy of what's happening, which you might want to be involved and in. maybe you don't necessarily always look long term. Like, could be wrong, but Carl Sinclair in the World Cup final, I'm sure if you'd asked him if he'd want to come off at that point, he'd say, absolutely not. Like, keep me on the field. So how do you go around that balancing act of saying to them, okay, we get that, you know, in the moment, at that moment in time, it's a big game for you, but you've got to think long-term and you, you don't want to end up like a, a Steve Thompson who some of the things he's recalling are, are really difficult and harrowing. Yeah, so again, if we're talking about a concussion, look, I've I mean, been through all the protocols myself. It is very hard to stay on that field now if you shouldn't be on the field and everyone follows the protocol. So, you know, if you display concussive symptoms, you're going to be assessed. If you're assessed, it's, it's practically impossible to, to fake the, um, the acronym is now, the, the return to play um, tests, which are done in the change room away from the field. Um, so in terms of that, I actually think that question of do you want to stay on the field doesn't really doesn't really exist anymore and players understand that more i think now whereas maybe 10 years ago there'd be a lot of players who might say i'll try and cheat my way through this test like, i think players understand that concussion is really important in terms of wider welfare you've absolutely hit the nail on the head so if you ask a player um at the end of pre-season like do you want to play right now and give up your extra week's holiday that you're supposed to have, I guarantee you that 90% of players will say, yeah, I'm ready to play. I'm gagging to play. I'm sick of fitness training. Get me on the field. Now, if you ask an England international coming out of the Six Nations who's just played five international 80 minutes on the bounce, how do you feel now? Do you want to give up your week's rest that you've earned um, and play next week? I guarantee you'll get a slightly different response. So you, you get real kind of ebbs and flows in the season as to how players are feeling. And if you think every player has their own individual circumstances as well, that's the difficulty of, of my job in trying to gauge at what time should we be asking the players, what 
time should we be taking the question out of the player's hands, which we do for concussion? Um, it's far from a simple answer. And, and, and the clubs have this issue too. The international teams have this issue. It's, it's far from easy, but you've, you've hit the nail on the head, really. You know, some, some players need protecting from themselves. Other players like to, like to complain about things, but actually they're not, they're not doing too bad. So it's, it's about trying to gauge the lay of the land for a lot of different circumstances. And making this, I guess, individual journey, obviously you mentioned earlier 16 years playing career. How did you do it from your perspective? <clears throat> how did you manage your well-being and your conditioning, etc., and put yourself in a position to have such a prolonged career that you had? You've sold me short, 17 years. Um, Sorry, 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I had... I, I started playing, like I said, just, just past turn of millennium. The game was a little bit different then. There wasn't um, the academy structures that were in place, that are in place now. So I, I actually went to university full-time at Manchester. Um, but then my playing career kind of took off a lot quicker than what I thought. So at 19, I was playing for Sale Sharks reasonably re regularly. So at that point, I you know I completed my degree. I did a four-year master's. Um, but rugby kind of took over. <clears throat> in terms of welfare, like I said, thing, things were a bit different back then. Squad sizes were smaller. Um, concussion wasn't um, wasn't such a well known and well publicised issue. Um, but I was one of those players who probably forged a career out of being dependable and available, and. I like to think I wasn't injured too much. I, I did have some pretty bad injuries in, over that time, but I was generally one of those players who'd be relied upon to to play week after week and, um, and supplement the kind of the more talented players around me, um, if I'm being honest. Um, I was always I'm a pretty academic person and um, always thought I looked after myself pretty well, but then... I probably experienced over my career plenty of players who had all the talent but didn't look after themselves so well didn't uh didn't train hard enough in the gym or didn't prepare well enough or didn't recover well enough and if you don't do those things that's where your welfare will suffer regardless of what um, safeguards are in place so i can think of plenty of players who weren't quite so talented but were so hard working and diligent Field, but they had really long, successful careers. And then I can think of much, much more players who had all the talent, but professional sport is very unforgiving. And if you, if you don't do the hard work, you, you fall by the wayside. Yeah, I won't ask you to name those players. I'm going to get you in trouble. So um, <laughs> I'll send the I, list. <laughs> <laughs> I guess for me, um, as you mentioned, you had a really long career and you would have played with, you know, some real outstanding stand, like players. What, for you, was the difference between maybe the elite of the elite that go on and play, you know, however many times for England or All Blacks or, you know, are constantly at that world level and then what a good premiership uh, player looks like? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I did. I, I've played with genuinely some of the best players who've ever played rugby. Um, so, I, you know, I got to play with the Sale Sharks, you know, Jason Robinson, um, you know, Sebastian Chabal. Um, uh, in Paris, I played with Sergio Parise, Juan Hernandez, um, Dimi Swareski, and then at Northampton. You know, that we had a, a spread from the, the Dylan Hartleys all the way through to the George Knotts. You know, some some sort of proper elite world <coughs> players. Where are my boys? Um, what sets them apart? It, it varies, again, player to player. Everyone will, um, you know, a lot of coaches kind of call it their superpowers nowadays. And all of them will have a superpower that is beyond belief at times. If you think how hard it is to get a professional contract in rugby, there must be thousands upon thousands of kids trying to get into academies. Each academy will take in 10 of them a year. One of them will make it, probably. Um, and then from those one who makes it, how many of those become a George North? 
very, very few. So, it, you know, it is the elite of the elite. A player like George North is physically freakish, like absolutely freakish. Um, he is as strong as the strongest guy you know. He's as quick as the quickest guy you know. He's explosive. He's fit. He's strong. Like he, it, they, physically, George is an absolute freak of nature. And then you go through to a Dylan Hartley, who physically not not unbelievable. You know, very very strong guy, robust guy, but he had a desire and a killer instinct and a belligerence, the likes of which I've never seen in any, another person. Um, he as well was a leader who just galvanized people to follow him. So that's why he ends up with 98 England cap. Um, every, every one of those world-class players will tick every box. They'll, they'll be hardworking, they'll be talented, they'll be skillful. They'll be able to do all that, but then they'll have something that sets them apart. Um, so yeah, it, it varies player to player. Like I say, I, I was probably good at lots of things, but not great. They, the, the properly world-class people are, are great at, that's why they're world-class. And looking at you, you also mentioned the sales sharp um, period, and then you moved to Stad from say, and got to do a little bit of research. You only had a couple of appearances whilst you were there. Um, what was the reason for that? Yeah, so, so at Sale, like I said, as, a, as one of the young players at Sale, I was, I was kind of the up and coming thing. I, I captain England, uh, 21s a year young, um, playing first team rugby at 19 as a second row, which at that point in time, no one did that really. Um, I think I was young player of the year in the premiership winning year, played loads of games that year, was around the edge of kind of England talk. And then kind of my form fell off a cliff kind of thing, or at least in, in their eyes it did. And all of a sudden I wasn't getting picked. Uh, and then one year later, it was kind of like, right, we, we'd like you to leave. That, that's how quickly things can change. So at that point in time, Stade Francais came in and they needed a, what's called a medical joker in France. They had a, a player, Pascal Pape, who went on to become a, a great player himself. And he'd, uh, they thought he'd torn his ACL. So they signed me. And then the week I arrived, they decided actually he hadn't torn his ACL, <laughs> um, which kind of explains why in, uh, in the, the season that I was there, I, I, I played, I started two games on the bench for two months. Um, so I played four games in, in a year. Um, but I'll tell you what, it probably made me that year because when I finished at sale, I just hated it. Um, like I said, I'd gone from being the big deal and, you know, an important part of that sale team to just being discarded. Um, so I was pretty much going to give up rugby at that point. And then Stad came in and I went to France, had, had amazing fun out there, saw a different style of rugby. <coughs> and then Jim Mallander was the new coach at Saints who'd worked with me as an academy player. Steve Diamond was the recruiter at the time and then and he I knew he liked me as a player. And they um they gave me the opportunity to sign for Northampton, who'd just come up from the championship and was a, kind of a, accumulating lots of good young players. Um and it was a perfect fit and, and stayed there for ten years. So when you're looking at making that jump, um and imagining your role now, this is probably something you can uh, help other professionals with when they move countries and coming across into the premiership and stuff. How was that for you, making that jump from, you know, England out to France, where I don't know if you could speak the language at the time, if you could or couldn't, or, you know, might not have had a lot of exposure to their type of culture and stuff. Was there anything that particularly stood out as that you found easy when you were out there or anything you found particularly challenging when you were there? Yeah, so look, there was... There was no support whatsoever when I moved out uh, to France. It was literally um, uh, a guy met me at the airport and handed me two sets of keys, one for my car and one for my apartment. It was just kind of like, off you go. Um, so look, I loved it. Like I said, I, I just jumped in two-footed. Um, I was 20, I was like 24 at the time, 24, 25. Um, so for me, 
living in Paris for a year for a year was massive fun. Um, players do struggle when they move country in particular, and we have some quite young guys as well who do that now. Um, I think the support structures in place now, and I can only speak for the Premiership, are massively advanced compared to um, compared to what I experienced. So if you think in the Premiership, there will there will be <clears throat> a team manager, a, a player liaison. There'll be um, there'll be mental health leads within the club appointed. There'll be ample medical care. You know, there's everything's there for the players who come in. It's these are the minimum standards that are set in order to try and prevent some of the you know some of the bad things that can happen if they are. So it's never easy. Like I said, language is a big barrier. I could speak a little bit of French, but I went out of my way to try and speak more um i didn't want to be i was the first englishman to play in paris um and i didn't want to be that guy who just didn't try so I, my french was kind of all right um but it was just a great experience for me and it was one of those it was a time in my career where i was on a you know it, it was a, a leap of faith kind of thing and it and it just worked and in terms of culturally the rugby styles did you see a discernible difference between the way that they perceive and act around rugby or uh, I guess you look on the outside of the poetic nature of a French team that you see that they're doing at the moment compared to maybe more pragmatic in England and stuff. Did you feel that when you were there? Did you feel the way that the players and the coaches and the fans spoke about it? Yeah, very, very, very different culture. Um we used to train early in the morning and then late in the afternoon. They they thought that that kind of middle of the day period was for for family and um you know you wouldn't stay at the club. So it was in the old job one, so it was quite a rundown facility. Um, but it would be like gym early in the morning. We used to train at the Bois de Boulogne, which if you know what goes on in that park, it was quite entertaining at times. Um, and training was really long. We used to do two two hour plus sessions on the field, which you know Premiership clubs don't do that. They keep it short and sharp. But it was all kind of at a relaxed level. It was longer, more relaxed. Um, but then they put huge emotion into their performances. So it would be so strange that there'd, there'd be like an away game that didn't really matter, and no one would seem to care much about the game. They'd, they'd send a a reduced team like a weaker team because no one really cared about the fixture and if you won you won if you lost you lost but then there'd be a a, a derby or a, a game against a rival and it's literally like the biggest thing ever everyone has to put their life on the line for this game and there'd be crisis meetings and the coach would be in tears and it was like it was crazy how they wrapped up the emotion around big games um like I say, it showed me something a bit different. I I like to think I kind of brought something a bit different as well. Like I am um, in terms of like the physical like preparation stuff. They they had a new kind of uh, uh, conditioner who was really trying to emulate what some of the English clubs were doing. So he used to talk to me for ages about what what I thought and should should we do this? Should we try this? Because at that time, again, the French clubs didn't really focus on that too much. So. Yeah, it was it was good. Like I said, it was it was a really good experience for me. I didn't play enough games, but but it really changed my outlook on rugby a bit. And then when I went to Saints, I was just really hungry to play, um, and, and was a part of a like minded group of quite young guys who who needed a bit of a fresh start. That was going to be my next question. Actually, like, did it change your outlook moving forward? So you obviously mentioned the initial year, but actually having that experience where you could say. You know, you can have peaks and troughs or you can have family time and you can, you know, be really emotional and learn how to rein it in and stuff. Did that, do you think that helped you moving forward? Yeah, I, I like to think I'm pretty good at that kind of thing. I'm pretty pragmatic and I'm good at dealing with uh, pressure and ups and downs and like that's one of my strengths. Um, I think that's true of anything, really. The more experience you have and the wider group of experiences that you have, the better you are equipped to deal with them. That's 
you know, that's a fact of life. So I'd say one thing for me personally, it probably made me a bit more grateful to be there. Like I said, at, at, say, at sale, everything had kind of worked for me and gone really well. And then that fell away. I then went to France where I had a great time but didn't get to play too much, but it opened my eyes to different people doing it different ways. I'd only ever known sale. It, when I joined Saints, I was pretty, you know, very grateful to be there. Um, and it made me want it a lot more, probably. Um, we had a, we had a, like I said, we had a really talented group of young players that began that journey. So if I think the year I joined there was Lee Dixon, Ben Foden, um, Stephen Myler had been there a year. Um, Dylan Hartley was just coming through as a young player. And we stayed at that club for, for 10 years each and, and we really went on that journey from coming up from the championship to winning the premiership and losing in, in a European Cup final. So it was, yeah, it was, it was good to have a bit more depth to my understanding of rugby but at that point I was just like this is my you know this was my chance to to make my mark really yeah, and something you hear about a lot in sports is like the specific team way so the Saints way or the New England way or anything like that obviously for you coming into that environment and being there as long as you have you would have kind of seen the creation of a culture and then I guess the manifestation over a, a long period of time of that constantly taking place and ingraining new individuals into it and you know senior players checking players that are getting out of hand and stuff is there anything you can put your finger on in the early days we say that really helped us to define what our culture wanted to be or a particular individual that you went that's what we're going to hang our hat on yeah so it developed over the you think of it the 10 years I was there it developed over time it, when we came together at first we were a young group we had some good leaders but we were young and at that point in time we had a a strong coaching group who were pretty pretty hands-on pretty pretty forceful so we had Jim Malander Dorian West Nick Johnson was the uh, head of performance who was a ex-military and um, very forceful around what he wanted and how to get the best out of people uh, we had Paul Grayson involved as well who was a, a bit of a, a you know a deeper thinker and at that point in time they they steered the ship but as I said as, as that developed they made Dylan captain in year one which was a big step because he was this hot-headed youngster who was a bit of a nutcase he then gradually increased his standing to the point that he controlled the ship. But under him, we had some really good leaders um, who did different things. Um, so you had people leading the likes of, um, like Stephen Myler is never going to shout at people and be a follow me type leader, but he was an incredible tactical thinker an incredible steady kind of guy who just does his job and everyone knew he was there. You had Lee Dixon, who was just massive ball of energy, who at times you wonder if he can read and write and kind of uh, function on a daily basis, but he was this massive bundle of energy who just gave everyone that energy. You had the likes of myself, who was very steady and kind of studious and, and set an example of working hard and, and doing all the homework off the field prepared us to be on the field. And then along that journey, different people joined who added to that as well. So the likes of Tom Wood, Alex Waller, who began as an academy player, who has gone on now to play 300 plus games. We just had loads of players who developed, were good leaders and we, we kind of started to take more and more control, which is ultimately what a lot of coaches think should be the case. I actually think that by the end of that time, the players probably had a bit too much control and we'd lost a little bit of that coaching element. We'd lost a little bit of their control, um, but it's easy to say that in hindsight. Um, and, you know, and a, and a good parallel to that would be Harlequins 
you know, at the moment who, under a very strong coach in Paul Gustard, didn't perform very well, if they're honest, if I'm being honest. But then all of a sudden, the players took control. They had a coaching team who facilitated that. They have got really good leaders there in, in Danny Kerr. Marcus Smith is a young, kind of up-and-coming star of the game. And they've had massive success in that model. So it's, again, there's always kind of evolution and, and it grows and it flows and, and you try and keep it in that space where the team performs. That's probably the best way of me trying to um, put it into words. Yeah, no, it makes complete sense. I think that what's interesting there is the different characters and how they're probably able to engage with everyone in the changing room. So if you had a bunch of shouters then, you know, your Stephen Myers and stuff might not relate to that if he wasn't within that. But actually having a wide range in group probably allows people to affect everyone in the group, which is really interesting. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to skip the questions. We're going to go to the last one for me, which is who is the, the best player you've played with or against and why? Apologies for that question. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, but I'll, I'll pick out one one person who was just a bit different. That was Jason Robinson. Um, he he was just. I spoke earlier about like world class players, and they have a superpower. So they're already a, an amazing player, and they do one thing on a world class level. Um, Jason had two of those things. He he was an incredible. I spoke about George North being an incredible athlete. He was an incredible athlete, like so explosive, so strong for his size, so fast, so quick. That set him apart. And when he got the ball, you just heard the whole stadium gasp a little bit. Like you knew he was going to do something. So he had that. But as well, he was just a ruthless born winner, like everything to him was com competition. And, and if you think of like really talented people, it tends to be they're not hungry in that way. Um, whereas Jason, I can remember a good one where I am, um, we said about good young players coming through together. So in the academy in my year at Sale was myself, Richard Wigglesworth, um, Warren Sprague. Uh, I can't think of the others. Anyway, a couple more players who went on to have long careers. And I remember Wiggy as an 18, 19 year old, we did testing in the gym and I think he did something like 35 pull-ups and, and set the record for the day. Kind of. So he was full of himself, 19 years old, I'm, I'm going to win. And Robbo kind of came into the gym late, kind of sauntered over to the pull-up bar and was like, what's, what's winning? And, and like 35, he went, okay. And he just jumped up on the bar, did 36, dropped down and just strolled off. Like didn't even didn't even look for recognition. Just was like, "What's what's winning?" Okay, I'll do one more, and that was him. And he just for that he um, and I still see him around at the moment, from time to time. And he's still the same character now. He he wants to win at things. He wants to be elite at things. Um, so he'll I'll, I'll have him as my number one. But there's countless, there's so many amazing players I played with, um, who were who were all special in their own way. Perfect. No, I think a really nice anecdote to finish on. But Christian, really appreciate you bearing with me at the start of this and a great conversation. Hopefully, uh, maybe further down the line, we can we can go over this again and catch up on around some other stuff around uh, your career and whatnot. But really appreciate your time and catch up with you again soon. No problem, Mike. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.